I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, is where I grew up, um, and uh, lived there through high school, and then uh, moved to Cleveland for undergraduate, and then New York for grad school. Kind of lived all over the place, New York, Los Angeles, Austin, Texas, and now I live in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. My first memory of music education, I was really entirely self-taught until I got to undergrad. Uh, where I did major in composition, but I never played in band or I was never in, you know, I never played an instrument at all. I never studied an instrument. So I was never in the music programs at my schools, unfortunately. So yeah, I never really had much exposure to, well, I had none to instruments and then everything was just self-taught. People always wonder, how did it work out that I never played an instrument? That kind of makes no sense to be a composer and not play an instrument at all. The way the story basically goes is that I have an older sister, Lisa, who's lovely, and she's eight years older than I am. And when she was young, my parents did try to encourage her to play an instrument. And we had a piano in the house, and they would put her at the piano and you know, try to get her to play, but she would hate it and cry and run away from the piano. And so when I came along, you know, several years later, I would choose to go to the piano and I would try to play it, but it didn't sound like the records we had of like Chopin etudes or whatever. So I would cry and I would run away from the piano. And they thought, oh no, we're gonna ruin him too. And so they would, you know, keep me away from the instrument. We were very poor and lived in areas that didn't have good music programs, honestly. So there wasn't really exposure to music in the schools where I went. But what did happen as a result of our economic status, which was poor, my mother was a flutist and played in community orchestras and sang in church choirs. And every week she would go to rehearsal with the community orchestra in town and she couldn't afford a babysitter. So I would go with her and I would sit in the back of the high school auditorium and I would hear all these rehearsals of, you know, whatever the community orchestra was playing that week. And then I would go to the concert with her because she couldn't afford a babysitter. And same with the church choirs that she was in. And she tried all kinds of different religions. So she sang in all kinds of different church choirs. And uh, I was exposed to a lot of different kind of church music that way also. When I was 11, my grandfather, who owned a music store, actually, um, so I, you know, know about you know music stores like Pepper going way way back as a you know tiny child. He played oboe and clarinet and flute and he was really into technology before a lot of people much younger than he was. Uh, so he got a computer before any of the rest of us did and he had a music program on his computer called Music Instruction Set and one day when we were visiting him at his house he said do you want me to show you how to write music? And I said sure that sounds really fun and I was 11 he showed me like, all right, if you're gonna write music, you need to know what your time signature is. And then you just have to put the right number of beats in the measure. And that's the only rule in music. As long as you put the right number of beats in the measure, you did it right. And as an 11 year old, I could figure out how to make a 4-4 measure or a 3-4 measure or 6-8 or whatever. And uh, I thought that was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And so finally I had an outlet for like being around music all the time with my mother and her playing at home all the time and things. but. Now I had some outlet to just, through osmosis, I was surrounded by music, but never had anything I could do with it because I didn't have an instrument to do it with. But now I had a computer, which became my instrument. I was what, at least in the 80s, would be referred to as like a latchkey kid. So I would get done with school at, you know, 2.30 or whatever, and I would go home by myself and uh, I would be home alone for hours every day. The rule was I had to go home and stay inside the house and, you know, no going out and, you know, playing or whatever until she was home and knew that I was okay. And what that meant is I spent a lot of time listening to the radio. Um, so I listened to a lot of pop radio in the early, early 80s, like, you know, 1980, 1981, 82, 83. I didn't know it at the time, but that music really had a big impact on the music that I still write today. The name of my publishing company is Osti Music, which is short for ostinato. An ostinato is like a repeated, you know, bass line, essentially. So, you know, if you listen to, you know, early Mike, like Michael Jackson songs from, you know, the Thriller album, you know, dun 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 that's an ostinato. And that became a thing that was a part of my style without knowing it. It was just a way I learned to write music because I had listened to so much of that kind of music, that pop influence when I was really, really young, and that just got in my head. And then when I started writing you know, concert music, although to me it wasn't concert music when I was 11 writing it, but that was the music I was listening to on the radio and mixing that with the music that my mother was playing in community orchestras, and you ended up with this weird hybrid that I still write today.
you know, I didn't ever study an instrument, but I did have a composition teacher, kind of. It was a friend of my mother's that she had been friends with since high school, who lived in Columbus, where we lived, and uh, he had gotten his PhD in music theory um, from Ohio State University, and his job was he was a cab driver. So I don't, maybe I should have taken that as like a sign, maybe don't try to be a composer, because actually he was a cab driver, but so was Philip Glass at one point. So it's, you know, that's, that's not a bad thing at all. So he wasn't really writing much, but he had studied composition and theory. And uh, so as a teenager, he did give me a few composition lessons and I would play him what I was writing on the computer and he would give me feedback and things. He never did teach me theory or anything. It was really just, oh, when you think about music, you know, think about how dissonance works and where you might wanna, this is awfully, you know, diatonic or staying in the same key for a long time. You might think about like some ugly notes to just give it some kind of contrast so that when we stop doing that, it becomes a different thing. So just thinking about music that way, he helped a lot. And we only had maybe a dozen lessons over the course of my whole, you know, middle school and high school, but it was still also just cool to hang out with someone who knew how to write music and knew how fun that could be. When I was, I guess I would have been 10 or 11, the movie Amadeus came out. And uh, so that coincided with me learning how to write music using music software. And I saw that movie in the theater and I thought it was so cool. I thought Mozart seemed really, really cool and really fun at parties. And I thought, I want to be that guy. And so my first piece that I ever wrote was called Lacrimosa. And um, you know, if you know the story of Mozart, especially as told in the movie Amadeus, which is pretty fictionalized, but um, you know, he did in fact die writing the Lacrimosa from his Requiem. Uh, he wrote the first 12 bars and then he died. And then Sussmeyer came along and finished it. But um, for some reason I thought that was, that seemed really cool as an 11 year old. And so I decided I'll write one too. I don't know why I was already so morbid as an 11 year old that I thought that's normal for kids to write a Lacrimosa. So I did and um, it was for clarinet, violin, viola, and double bass. Um, clarinet because my grandfather who taught me how to read music played clarinet, and I don't know why the other instruments. I don't know why double bass. Um, I didn't know how clarinet worked, so I wrote it on the computer, and then I hand copied out the parts onto paper so it looked like real music. And I knew that clarinet was in B flat, but I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that that meant it was off by a step. So I wrote the part out, clarinet off by a step, but I accidentally wrote it for clarinet in D. So <laughs> that's not probably the best instrument that anybody wants to hear. And if that, I guess that's probably a real clarinet. But so that was my first piece. Um, it was never performed. It has still never been performed. All that music I wrote through uh, most of high school was just for my own learning process on the computer. And I wrote a piece for choir um, that my high school show choir recorded for me. Not with like, you know, woo, show choir, but uh, they were the best. It was like a chamber singers group, really. So they recorded that for me and that became one of my audition pieces for, for undergraduate. And I also wrote a piece for violin and piano and a friend of mine who played piano and also played violin multi-tracked herself recording that for me. So I had that as my other piece for auditions. I believe that piece for violin and piano, one movement of it did get played at an art museum when I was a junior or senior in high school. And that was the only performance I ever had of anything of mine until college.